Welcome to the Spent the Rent podcast. I am your host, Patty Rose. My guest today is a Northwest hip hop legend, Mac Dub. Mac Dub, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Patty Rose. I'm really happy to be here, brother. This is really cool. You've been doing the circuit a little bit. Uh, it's kind of cool to even have that in, in Lane County that we now have uh, a plethora of podcasters. A lot of them have background in hip hop, you know, so you just did one tuxedo talk with CJ Steez. Uh, 86th is his brand as well. That was cool. I watched that last night. Uh, so he's been a guest on my show as well. And then I noticed that you were also a guest on Broken Radio 541 with Absolutely. Nate Ingman. And that guy is a character. He's one of my favorite human beings. He is a extremely funny, talented human being. And on top of that, he's, he's a really cool dude too, man. I like him a lot. Yeah. Shout out Nate Ingman and my yeah, man yeah. CJ Steez. I'm going to definitely get him back on. We end up talking about mostly wrestling, which is funny right. whenever I've had him, I've had him on the podcast once and I don't even watch wrestling, but somehow it all, everything about him always ends up going back to wrestling. He, has, so. he definitely has an affinity for the craft. And it's not even new wrestling, just eighties. He's still yeah, a oh, yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. When, well, when I, you know, in the eighties, uh, when I was, when I was just a young guy, wrestling was huge, man. I mean, oh, it's yeah. huge now, but it was, it was huge. We, um, Wrestling was actually banned in my house as um, a middle schooler. Uh, we lived in a giant apartment complex. It was like its own little city in Federal Way, just south of Seattle. And wrestling was always on on Sunday afternoons or Saturday afternoons. I don't remember. But everybody would watch wrestling. And then we would go to the playground that was in the middle of uh, the apartment complex. And it would always start out as wrestling. But inevitably, you know, somebody would get elbowed or somebody would get kneed, you know and pain would become involved. And then, so the wrestling always transitioned into these brawls. So that the we were television having. wrestling, your parents are like, no, like we're just yeah. cutting it off at the, at the start. Yeah. Yeah. And we, I mean, it's, it, if you can just imagine, you know, a bunch of elementary school and middle school kids just rolling around on the grass, trying to be tough and fighting. It's actually pretty comical. It actually got to the point where um, my dad would say, all right, because I can't trust and you know, I don't know what channel you're going to watch when I'm gone on Sunday afternoon, you can't even have the TV on. <laughs> he would come home and he would put his hand on the TV. Um, and if it was warm, you know, we were getting grounded okay. for a week. That's awesome. That's like how you get a DUI if you're in the back seat and you're in your car. <laughs> this car is warm. Anyway, uh, anyway, uh, Mac Dub, thanks for doing this. This is really cool. We've got a new album to promote. That's kind of what we're here to do. We're going to get to that in a little bit. So I want to first kind of touch on who you are. If, uh, my audience is unfamiliar. Uh, you know, you're a legend in hip hop, live in Portland now, but uh, grew up, you know, lived in Eugene, went to Sheldon High School 100 years ago. Right. Go Irish. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about your age. Uh, I think it's kind of inevitable. 51 sure. making rap music and hip hop, right. which, is, which is rad. And you're, you definitely still got it. We're going to play one of your songs at the end of this episode. Uh, I've known who you are since I first started going to hip hop shows in Eugene, uh, I'm kind of a weirdo in the <laughs> way that I make music that I was always like, you know, I'm not going to lie. You're, you could, I'm going to get your input on this. It's funny, but I, I, you know, people are haters. And so I was always like, Oh, I don't want to go to that show. Cause if there's a dude named Matt with Mac in his name, I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I fit. Cause I was never really into gangster rap music. Sure. But then as I evolved as a, as a fan of art, I realized I don't have to be the artist. You know what I'm saying? Like I can look at what they do and learn from their experience. That's the beauty sure. of it. Took sure. me a long time to get to that point with rap. Sure. And that's something that now when I listen to your, your delivery, your flow, your context, content is solid, you know, and I respect it a lot. So it's, I mean, it, it was name alone and I was a young naive kid and had my own impression on, on what I thought. I was like, Ooh, I don't want to be in this kind of like hood style rap music. And so sure. I it sure. was a weird, so, you know, I'm 38, so we are older uh, older dudes in the hip hop game, you know, today, but like, uh, it was a weird, it was a hard sell for me with rap music early on. I listened, there was this weird transition. If you remember in the early nineties, I was really into public enemy and I got that, that I wasn't like, sure. I wasn't like that, you know, but I was learning from that. But then there was this gangster rap thing. And what happened is a lot of white kids that I was friends with started like, doop, just turning the hat to the side. And they're like, Oh, now all of a sudden I'm different. Mm -hmm. you, know I, you know what I'm saying? And so <laughs> that was where for me kind of turned me off to it, but I've evolved and I respect a lot of 
what people do if they're honest and true to themselves. And you don't make hip hop music as long as you have, if you're not being honest, <laughs> you know, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, sure. sure. So, uh, you know, we talked about how you've been making hip hop for a long time. When did you really start making tracks? When did you really start recording? So, you know, back, back, back when, when, all, when this all kind of started to come to be for me, there was no place to record. Um, you know, I, I, su- I suppose you could, you, you know, you could have gone to a studio back in the eighties and I'm not sure what it would have cost, but we didn't, we just weren't at that point in our life. So it was just freestyling, beatboxing, rapping over break beats, um, you know, on dance mixes, things like that. Um, and I, so I didn't, I think the first time that I recorded a song was in 1989. Um, it was a vanilla ice disc track. Nice. That's that's how long ago this was. Um, he did an interview on uh, MTV and he was being sarcastic and they'd ask him something. And he's like, well, I'm nobody. I'm just vanilla ice. And so we sampled that and we just thought we had him, you know, we're like, oh yeah, we got you. You're nobody, you know, you're vanilla ice. And, and I went over to PSLs. He lived behind uh, when black Angus was on Franklin um, by the old DMV. And he just had a minuscule setup and a four track recorder. And um, I recorded my verse and he played it back. And I, in that moment, I said, I'm done rapping. That's it. I sound horrible. This right. is terrible. Your voice, like my voice sounded like nails on a chalkboard to me. And I was like, I'm done, bro. I can't do it. This is horrible. And he goes, no, 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 just calm down. He's like, we got, we got three more tracks. He's like, so just go back in. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> He's like, just go back in re-record the vocals again and then i'm just going to pan them left and right and give you a broader spectrum for your voice i went back in and i did it and i loved it and i was you know and i've and i've and i've been in love with you know rap music ever since right and you know i i'm anytime you listen to anything i've ever recorded there's layers for sure right you know because it's it adds that depth and as an artist, I know exactly what you mean. You record and you're like, whoa, no, no. And then you right. start adding a little bit of filler and some other stuff. And sometimes a whole track can be missing something. And all you got to add is a rah. And then you put sure. some reverb on it. And you're like, oh, now it's good. Yeah. Like now so it's, it's there. I, I don't know. It's really cool. And I mean, I, it, when I talk to hip hop artists, I always kind of laugh because I don't, I'm not claiming that we're in the same area code. I mean, my stuff is so amateur and so for fun, you know what I mean? And, and you've really crushed it and, and done it for a long time. So I want to make that clear, like when we, when we swap these stories, but the beauty of it, I actually saw something recently that was really cool. It was just a meme and I'm going to paraphrase it and butcher it, but it said something about there's no different, like for an artist, uh, success and failure don't matter because they're both a myth. Yeah. And I thought that was really cool because as an artist, you do it because you love it. And, and so if you succeed, that's really a myth. I mean, we've only, had, we've only had people getting wealthy off of music to the scale it is today for like 100 years or something stupid. Sure. You, know, you know what I mean? It wasn't sure. even done that way. Anyway, so, so 89 started, really hit it big for you in, in 2000, early 2000s, right? That's when you started cutting albums. It is, yeah. I, I probably made 150 songs before that. We just recorded them all on tape. You know, a lot of them were freestyles and then we'd come up with a hook and just freestyle the verses, maybe do a written verse every once in a while, but really just through the nineties, just really working on the craft, you know, formatting words, um, you know, learning how to, how to write a verse, how to, how to, you know, formulate a song, just, just learn and learn and learn and learn and, um, until the technology kind of got to a, a point in terms of pricing that, you know, just some regular guys could actually go yeah. out, you know, you grab a laptop or you got a, you know, you got a PC and you get a little interface and a mic, you know, and then whatever software that you choose to use and, and you're ready to roll, you know? And I think that changed, that changed the game for everybody. And it also meant that, you know, like it, at that point we had gone to this, we were going to the studio sometimes, but it might've been 35, 40 bucks an hour back yeah. then. And, you know, and, and, and guys didn't make a lot of money back then in the nineties, you know, you just, if maybe if you were slanging, you know, and you had a, and you had hustle money and a lot of people did, and they used that money for that. But yeah, the whole, the nineties, mid to late nineties was just learning how to make the songs, crafting the style. By the nineties, 
I had people that I could work with, you know, er, early on, most of the homies, they couldn't rap, you know, they would try a little bit and then, you know, it just never really lasted that long. Um, I think they just kind of realized it wasn't for them, but for me, it was just always a thing and it came easy for me. Um, and I, you know, I only, I only do a few things in life that I'm good at. And it just, I, I, you know, I take photographs, I draw a little bit, I paint a little bit. I was pretty good at sports and I rap, you know? And so I just kind of found, you know, where I wanted to be. And then I just, you know, I stay in that lane, man. Just been perfecting the craft for, for many moons. Those art forms. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. I actually wrote that in my notes, the photography. I was looking at your Instagram and we'll put the link in the show notes to that really cool stuff, you know, real colorful, bright. And then uh, some abstract art painting that you've done is really cool as well. You know, we'll get to that in a bit, but those types of, of art forms that, and then writing songs, it's just so therapeutic. You know, a lot of times you got a lot of pain or whatever you're feeling inside and you can just kind of get that out. The, the photography looks more like your appreciation of beauty. And that's another thing that's, that's really cool. So there's a lot to it. Uh, you know, you, you early two thousands, you were kind of bouncing around back and forth between Portland and Eugene. Were you doing shows at that time quite a bit or just kind of recording tracks? So we, the shows did start to roll in um, and they, it was becoming easier to get booked. Um, we were getting a little older, so we knew more people um, and, and, and venues were starting to open up and seeing that, you know, that they could sell 1500, $2,500, $3,000 worth of drinks a night. Right. It's and the so turnout that I, really matters. Yeah. So I think that they were willing, you know, to, um, to take us on. Um, and then they did, the shows just started getting better and better and more people, um, started, you know, showing up because of the buzz. Um, so yeah, we, we, by, by the early two thousands, we were definitely, were doing a lot of shows. That's the thing that is hard for a lot of people now to understand that with hip hop, it was tough. It was tough to sell it. You go to these, these venues, these bars, basically a lot of times that the, the, the business owners were like, I'm not into this music, but all right. they, what they really in, are into is money. So right. at a certain point you're like, look, I can promise you, you know, 60 to 200 heads or something like that. And in a bar, that sounds small, but that's good. You know, <laughs> like you said, 1300 bucks. Right. And so, I mean, they would screw musicians over, but what they didn't understand, it's like, you know, we're a hip hop crew. So there's five of us. You're only having to pay five people that could do three hours worth of entertainment instead of seven, ba six, you know, three bands of five people each. There's 15 right. people. Right. You know, and then the sound man was like, Ooh, this is cool because I just plug in your little mini disc player or whatever it is. And then, you know, yeah, we're not tuning guitars and getting levels for drums and yeah. yeah. And then CDs yeah. came along, you got your beats on a CD looper and then you're jumping on stage and it skips. That shit was real fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I got a fun question for you. What was your best in Eugene specifically? I know you don't, you you live in Portland and done a lot in Portland, but I know that Eugene's always been near and dear to your heart going to school here, that kind of stuff. And this show is based in Lane County. So, what was your best and worst show in Eugene? We'll start with your, your worst. We'll start, we'll start bad and then we'll go good. Okay. So, um, I think it was in 2011. Um, this was, this was when, uh, when I was doing the green state thing with Justy Fuller and Josh Fuller, shout out to my Fuller boys. Dusty's out there doing big things in the industry. The living in yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, really blown up. Um, got a lot of great industry credits and just, paving a path for uh, Eugene. And I'm super proud of you, by the way, brother. Um, so we had a group, Green State. It was really their group. And I, you know, I, they just kind of made me an honorary member because I was the big homie and I was the one with the connections and the experience and, and all this type of stuff. And so it was, it was a good mix. We, we made a lot of great music, a lot of great memories, had a lot of fun. Um, but what happened was... Um, I'm trying to remember what the name of the radio was. It ninety five five. That 94, was ninety four five ninety four nine jams. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And so uh, they had a contest, and um, it was like a battle of the bands type of thing. But it was for hip hop, and um, there was a couple rounds, and um, and I, I I remember I I think in the first couple rounds I was there for whatever reason for the last round I couldn't be there. Um, and so Dusty and Josh went out by themselves, won the contest, and I'll never forget because I remember Dusty calling me up and just saying, Daddy O, Daddy O, man, we won, bro, we won. Just as much as excitement as, you know, a young artist could have at that time, you know, on the scale that we were experiencing any kind of joy. 
And um, he's like, bro, the, the grand prize for winning this contest is we get to open up for Lil Wayne, Lil Wayne at oh, yeah, yeah. back court. Right. And so, of course, we're just beyond excited. I mean, I'd opened up for, you know, Digital Underground and Naughty by Nature, you know, E-40, you know, just Twista. There was, you know, there was good Bone Thugs. There was like good shows. They were, they were good shows. But at that time, in that moment, Lil Wayne, he was the premier hip hop artist in the world. It was right during the Carter series. It, it, he's probably, you know, never made as much money since or been as popular since. So we're going into this beyond excited. Just like, this is going to be the greatest night of our life. 3,500 people. Right. And we're going to kill it. We're going to get our name out there. We're going to get way more followers on MySpace. Hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so that morning, the morning of the show, <clears throat> I was at Dusty's house. Most people were still asleep. And my phone rings. And it's Todd G. Shout out Todd G, one of my best friends on this planet. And really the reason why I'm sitting here right now doing this interview with you, because I dropped this new album, because of my man, Todd G, I love you, homie. So my phone rings and it's Todd G. <clears throat> and he says, and I'm like, what up? And he's like, oh man, I got some really bad news. I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. And I'm like, bro, I have a show today. Like, don't do this to me right now. And he's like, well, unfortunately it has to do with the show. And I'm like, well, you know, what the fuck is going on? I had no idea what he was going to say to me. And he says, Lil Wayne got arrested in Idaho last night. Uh. He's not getting out of jail until the weekend's over. And you're, and you're fucked. And I'm just immediately just... I remember ab- that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely sick to my stomach. And so finally, you know, everybody gets up. And I'm just like, hey, we got to sit down. We, gotta, we have to have a talk. And I told everybody. And at first, they were in disbelief. And, you know, thinking, oh, man, they'll get him out. They'll get him out. They'll, you know, they'll figure out a way you know, da, 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 all this stuff. And I'm just, and I, I said, I simply said, we, you need to prepare that this is not going to go down the way that you want it to go down. So fast forward to that night, we show up, we're taking pictures, we're kicking it. I literally almost got trampled by fat Joe and his circle of his entourage circle. They walked in lockstep like military and he was in the middle and there was no, you couldn't ram a bull through those people to get to fat Joe. I, I just got done smoking a joint outside. I walked into the, one of the back doors back into Matt court and I look at my peripheral vision and I see fat Joe and I start kind of, you know, sauntering over, like, I'm going to be like fat Joe, what up? And they literally just walked right through me. Like I wasn't even there. <laughs> and that's when I knew I was like, you know what, this is probably not going to be that good of a night. So, um, Oh, I can't remember the name of the hip hop band that was really popular at the time. From they Eugene? were, huh? From Eugene? Yes. Was um, it Medium Troy? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. the opener, so it was Medium Troy, Green State. Right. I remember. Holly Murphy. Quick side and note, and I'm going to, quick side note, because the reason I know that, and I don't want to get you off track, but I did that same Battle of the Bands. I got last <laughs> place, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but Medium Troy was oh. one or two. the top couple got in on that bill. Right, I remember right, that. Right, yeah. So right. go ahead. Right. So, so it's medium Troy, green state, Charlie Murphy, Sean Kingston, wow. Fat yeah. Joe and Lil Wayne. Right. And the funny thing looking back on it now is that they didn't need any of those acts. The only act that they needed. And the only reason people were showing up to that show was for Lil Wayne. So I don't know why they spent all the other money on all those people. It doesn't matter at the end of the day, medium Troy goes out to play there's probably 1,500, 1,700, you know, right. 2,000 people there. And I'm like, all right, guys, let's get ready because we're going to go next. And right when Medium Troy, the lights were still on, but they were low. And then right after Medium Troy got done performing, they dropped the lights. And I'm like, ooh, this, I don't, this is kind of weird. And so I went up to Dustin Locke and I said, hey, are, you know, are we going up next? And he goes, he goes, no, 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 we got to throw Charlie Murphy out there. We'll run a little behind or whatever. He's like, we'll get to you. We'll get to you. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, you don't start these national acts and have in, yeah. an opener. So to, just to kind of fast forward again, Charlie Murphy gets booed off stage. He slams the mic on the ground, tells everybody to fuck off. He walks off. They bring Sean Kingston out. 30 seconds later, they're booing him off stage. Wow. 
I go down in the bathroom because Josh and uh, and Ryan Levitt are down there, and they're just in the they're just in there puking, crapping, just so nervous. Right. Um, and and I'm like, guys, it's really bad. And and I remember Josh telling me, you remember this, Josh? He's like, man, don't tell me this right now. I'm fucked up. My stomach's so fucked up. I'm so nervous. I'm like, bro, it's gonna go bad. You need to know that. Just prepare. I go back upstairs. They're like, bring out Fat Joe. Fat Joe comes out. He's a platinum artist a platinum artist at any other time they could have done fat Joe by himself. And it would have been a great show. They boo him off the stage. Wow. Now everybody other than medium Troy has been booed off stage because what happened was word started traveling through the crowd that Lil Wayne wasn't there. And so they boo, they boo, you know, uh, they boo fat Joe off and they're like, we want Wayne. We want Wayne. You know, we right. want Wayne. And all of a sudden, I can't remember the guy's name that owned the radio station. Masters. Something. Steve Masters, yeah. You're a Steve fucking Masters. punk, Steve Masters. <laughs> and I'll leave so that bad. at that. You're it's a nine years punk. ago. No. Anyway, he looks at us and he's like, go, 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 get out there. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? There's, there's, it's me. Shout out to Steel Trap. We wanted to fight the whole Matt Court, by the way, by the time this was <laughs> over. He was not scared. And of course, that's why you end up being a UFC fighter, because you're not scared. So they're like, go, go, go. And we just panic. We just go running out on the stage. Music's blaring. The mics are not on. Oh and God. so we're, we're jumping around, and we're, we got dancers. We got hype men. I mean, we just got a, it's a whole fucking circus. The mics aren't on. All of a sudden, the booze just start uh. raining down. Brother, at that point, I had been performing. I'd been rapping for almost 30 years at that point. Sure. Or 25 years at that point, sorry. And I'd never been booed one time. And now all of a sudden, we are just in boo, boo, boo. People are screaming. Now here comes drinks are flying, batteries, Damn. coins, anything that somebody didn't want to leave with from that show, right. they threw it at us. The song was coming into an, to an end. I looked at the first song and I looked at Dusty and I said, bro, we are done. And he goes, no, 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 no. Do one more song, one more song. He's like, we're gonna win them over. I promise you, this is our best song. We're gonna win them over. I'm like, bro, they are not here to see us. Right. They're here to see Wayne. They know he's not here. So anyway, they played the other song. The same thing happens for three and a half minutes. So you headlined for, for for Fat Joe though, so that's cool. There you go. Right, yeah, Fat <laughs> Joe. Oh, perspective. Yeah. So, just to put in a bow, it went from what was going to be the greatest night of my musical life and my music career to the absolute worst experience that I had had. Yeah. Even worse than showing up to a show with ten people and five of them are the rappers, and then the other five are their girlfriends. Sure, you know sure. what I'm saying? Yeah. Because because we I, walked. <clears throat> We walked out of that place. I must have told 1,500 people to fuck off. <laughs> Every step Man. that I took walking, I was like, fuck you, fuck you. I, I was as angry as I had ever been in my life doing music. Yeah, I got I to gotta give uh, – I know that 94.9 was a shit show. I used, to, I used to work at Supercuts on West 11th. I was the store sure. manager, uh -huh. and they were right above us. And so I talked to them quite a bit. And we actually, when I was with uh, the Clowns of Class, a crew with Uncle Nancy, and then it was a combined crew with, D with DCL, with Dusty Locke, mm -hmm. and a bunch of guys. We combined th reward system, three blind mics, which is now Awkward Storms, and then the Antidope, and we were the Clowns of Class. And we got offered to open for the game. And I said no. And my, everyone was pissed at me. And that is exactly why I said no. Because I'm I like, you guys show. don't know what the fuck you're doing. You yeah, don't know what I, you're doing. I performed at that show as well. I was there. I'm sure it was a train wreck. You know? So they, but it, to give them some credit, they hit the ground running with that radio station. It was a failure, in my opinion, because they were sloppy. And I want to say something about Dusty. Dusty is one of the most incredible human beings that exists. It's not on him. Dustin Locke, I love you. You're yeah, yeah. It's it, it's not on him. Talking about Steve Masters, I'm not talking. No. About and and even the even him, you. I will give him credit that they were trying stuff that they didn't know what they were doing, you know. But they were really going for it, and so I will give him a, a, a at least some credit for attempting it because they were because I mean, can you before that could you imagine Little Wayne even being in Eugene? No, you know, no, you know what it, I'm saying. So it's it really comes down to the way you treat people, and I think that would that would be that would be my beef. Well, sure. it's just and that's just fair. 
you know, just the way that some people were treated. So what a train wreck. So now let's, let's end this category of the, of the episode on a positive note. So tell me about your best experience in Eugene or one of your favorite. And like you just said, sometimes it can be a small intimate show that's actually popping off and it's just a great vibe. (coughs) What's the first one that comes to mind about like maybe the, one of the best nights in Eugene? Sure. So there's two, the first one, it was probably 2000 four or three and uh my buddy jay blanco jacob bustamani love you homie games to zinc um threw a show at the wow hall and you know it was it was games to mac dub michael k endo loon you know it's probably a couple other acts that i'm forgetting i'm sorry and uh uh i remember i walked out on the stage i had my gen x sweatsuit on i just you know had my brand new shoes and I walked out on the stage and I was performing and I remember looking down at the crowd, which isn't that far of a look, but you know, I'm looking down at the crowd and there's probably, you know, 250, 300 people and they're just, it completely engaged, reaching for me, high-fiving, handing me weed, you know, like girls rubbing my leg. And I just remember in that moment thinking, this is what it feels like to be a star. Like, right. this is the this is the what people chase in, in when you in terms of performing and stardom and and you know all the stuff that comes with the music lifestyle and 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 having people respect it and so i i remember in that in that particular moment um it was just as as good a feeling as you could possibly have um and after that show um you know i called everybody and i said hey i got an idea this is what I'm going to do. I want to do summer jam like the big yeah. city do, but yeah. we're only going to do it for you, for Oregon and Eugene. And we're only going to have acts from Oregon. And everybody, everybody said, dude, you're crazy. Nobody's going to show up. Nobody cares. And you know, they looked at me and they're like, bro, like why would anybody show up just because you're going to throw the show? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, yeah that is why. And the presentation was good. You guys ended up having glossy flyers with all the, and you showcased, you know, when I started this podcast, my girlfriend told me something because I would make jokes about how it was really small. And she'd be like, act famous. Right. That's what she told me. She said, act famous. I, I shouldn't have admitted this, but, but I, I started kind of doing that because my guests are small scale, but I'm doing it for, for, for this community. And Absolutely. people want want what's in, they want to know what's going on in their community. Their community. Those course. Summer Jam's events were big. I remember. So, so you fast forward and I, I took it as a personal challenge. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to show you that I can do this. And so the first year, um, we sold out the wow hall that was yeah. 2005 or 2004. And after the show, I said, I'm going to get a thousand people to the McDonald theater next year. Right. Michael K and Jordan Clint love you both. Um, we're working at K duck, you know, Michael was DJing at K duck. And so we had a good in there. Um, you know, we got a good, we got a good rate on the advertising. We, we had, we had really good synergy. Everything came together. Right. And we got 990 people to come to a local rap show at the yeah. McDonald theater. That's a which great is, venue. Yeah. Which as far as I know, I don't know if, if a local rap show has beat that, um, since 2005, if they have, you know, good on you. But I would say that that night, just the culmination of it all getting all, you know, anybody that was doing anything in hip hop at the time that I could find to come on stage. I think we probably had 25 acts and just imagine taking on that type of project as well. I mean, that's, it was I a festival. I remember it was like a festival. That's it what was it like, it it was. Felt like a showcase of all of, you know, the <laughs> rappers in Eugene. I remember the flyers. I remember everything about it. I remember some of the people that got picked for it. Some of the people that didn't, you know, right. Cause there was kind of two sides to the hip hop scene. You know, we had the punk rock kids, like my crew, my side, sure. you know, and even some of the more abstracts like Marvellous, you know, that where there are kind of, I don't know the word, but more organic kind of sounding. Yeah, no, of course. And Marvellous performed. And then you guys had more, Pro. what's that? Marvellous performed with Genius right. Pro. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Genius great, Pro. Great, was on, great they were group, on top of the way. world for a little bit. You know, yeah, they were the great, number one. Great group, by the way. Yeah. Eugene's uh, in the Eugene Weekly Awards. They were a couple of times and I yeah, that was a good deal. Yeah. There was a lot of good hip hop in Eugene. There you know? was, and there still is. Oh yeah, there, there and there's young kids. You know, some of them are U of O students that are that are here that bring their their stuff. But unfortunately, with COVID and then with karaoke, 
it's kind of hard to find venues that'll believe in you because they're like, no, I could pay this person 600 bucks or whatever, 400 bucks, depending on the size of the venue. And then that's it, you know, but well, that's interesting. You know, I love hearing those old stories about the different, different, uh, cons, you know, shows and how they go good and bad. The last time I saw you perform was with Ender One when he did his record release mm-hmm. show and you and DZO and like a lot of the old timers were there just killing it. And you know, that was a, that was a fun night. That was at the wow hall. It was. And it was like what you were talking about where people were just engaged. People were like, yeah. And you, and you know, you look around the crowd and it's the, this was what last year. And you look around the crowd and you see the faces and everybody's just like, it's the same people, you know, but they're just older and slower. So people were moving a little less. Ender's, <laughs> you know, but Ender's, Ender's got a great fan base, man. And he's earned it. He puts on a great show. Ender one was my first guest and I was trying to make this scheduling with another guest kind of fell apart. That's a long story. This was going to be my hundredth episode. It's actually episode 99, but because, you know, I will never forget the roots of this podcast. The roots of the spent the rent podcast started, uh, you know, spent the rent records was my made up record label. Right. And so the, the podcast originally, I thought I would interview local musicians. And then there's a lot of people doing that. And there's just too much political stuff I want to cover. But it's, I'm always going to bring people like yourself back on to tell your story about your art. It's just, it's pretty rad. So changing gears a little bit, uh, you know, you became a father pretty early on. But when did you in your music career realize, I got to think about this a little bit? And how did you alter it being a father? You know, like when you write music because a lot of your music's pretty pretty you know uh lots of language pretty heavy sure. uh sure. how do you balance that kind of duality of your life being a, a gritty artist and then also a father yeah you know it's 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 interesting because you know my, my youngest is 22 now king he's on the he's on the album um he's he's on he's on track nine done waiting did a great job only the second song he's ever recorded went really well i'm really proud of your son and i love you very much um as i do all of my kids um, yeah, so, you know, we're rolling in the car, you know, me and the wife and, and the kids and, you know, it's motherfucker this and, you know, da, 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 da. And, and I, I just kind of had an epiphany, I think like a lot of people do. And I was, I just thought, you know, I, I can't, I, I just can't do this. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to roll around, listen to these albums, which you have to listen to them a lot when you make them to figure out what's working and what isn't working. Um, and so I just made a, a conscious decision and for probably about five years, um, I didn't swear a single time on any of my albums. The subject matter was still the same, but we, we just took the, uh, we just took the, 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 you know, the cussing out. This is, um, life and times of young will the Mac right here. Um, and it came out in 2005. There's 28 tracks and not a single, not a single swear word. Wow. Um, on the entire, entire album. Um, and, and I got a little pushback from people when they'd come over and I'd be like, Hey, when you write, you know, write what you want, but just no cuss words. And, you know, so of course some people were, uh, you know, like, well, how am I going to rap and I can't use my shit and you know, this and that and da, 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 da. But, but we worked it out and it was fine. And you, I, I think it is important that you are conscious of your children and, and the, the messaging that they're hearing from you. Right. Um, and so I was always very, you know, upfront with my son, typically talked to him like he was a lot older than he was when he was younger. Um, sure. because at some point th- this is the kind of rhetoric and these are the conversations that you're going to be having and they're going to be along these subject lines and maybe the temperature and the tenor of the conversation is a little older and more mature. And I, you know, I, his mom would always say, Oh, just let him be a kid. He's just a kid. You know? And I'd be like, well, he's not always going to be a kid. And so, you know, we're going to talk about these things. And I, and for him and I, it worked really well. He's a great kid. He's, you know, never been to jail. He's, you know, not addicted to drugs or alcohol or, you know, he's just a, he's just a good solid kid. And so becoming a father definitely kind of, I don't want to say forces you, but pushes you along to, you know, evolving, growing, figuring out a different way to kind of, you know, get the messaging out that you want to get out without the profanity. Um, right. And it, and it worked, it worked, um, it worked good. And he, like I said, he turned out to be a great kid and here I am still about to be 52 years old on November 8th, Scorpio gang. Let's get it. (laughs) Um, we're crazy. Jesus Christ. That's harsh. Um, but no, I, you know, I, I, I guess I just did what I, you know, what I could do. And with, uh, with the, the set of circumstances that I had, 
Um, and I, and I, think, I think we all turned out all right along the way. I think the best parenting skill or the best parenting technique isn't really words, it's actions. So, yeah. so you know, when you teach a kid, I mean, rap music is, is misunderstood by a lot of people because it's party music, you know? So there's some misogyny and some things in there that some people, you know, might not understand, might not be cool with. But at the end of the day, when your son sees you treating a woman with respect, treating, you know what I'm saying? That's what's really going to hold its weight. I mean, the rest of it's a show. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Yeah, and, so and it's all ego as well, right? You know, it's hundred percent. So it is you and it derives from you, but it's it's just a different part of us um and just a different way of expression. And you know, I, I still got up and went to work every day. Um right. you know, while I was doing music, because as you know, it's really hard to sell albums and sure. really, really difficult to make a living as a musician. So you know, he saw both of his parents go to work every day. We were there every day when he woke up and went to bed. And we went out all his football games and basketball games and plays and, you know, all the stuff that, uh, that, that uh, you know, American kids, um, you know, need and kind of just the way that we raise them in this culture. So, you know, he saw both sides of it and he, you know, I think he understood it. Totally. And I mean, I just, I know a lot of people will look at it and be like, you know, but realistically, it's like, dude, walk a day in our shoes. We're, we're right. being real. A lot of times right. the kids, you don't want to be your kid's best friend in a lot of ways. I mean, at a certain age, you can be, but when you're raising them, you got to be a parent first. But then also it's like when you're approachable and honest and real, and you're talking about actual everyday life and experiences and not just saying like, no, no, don't do that. That's the end of it. That's not, you know, so there's a balance for sure. But uh, so let's talk about the album. KMAC Radio, after a five-year hiatus, you got back into the studio and, and, and doing it again. You know, what was it that made you take five years off? Oh, good question. I got sour, man. I got really sour. I was, I was run down. I was burnt out on failing music relationships. I was burnt out on problems within our crew and the group dynamic you know the the dynamics of the of the group of people not of a group that we were in um you know tired of posting links to my album to get four likes and two comments and um i I have 11 albums that most people have never even heard um 275 songs that i know of that i've done just since 2003 most people couldn't tell you the name of three of the songs. So I was making the music just because I loved it. And like when I was rolling, it's just when it's flowing, it's just kind of simple, you know, to make the music and, and knock the music out, but it's a whole nother deal to get people to listen to it. You know, I always say you can make it, but you can't make people listen to it. And so years and years of, you know, frustration, um, you know, the, the summer jam became harder and harder to throw because the venues were limited. It was either the McDonald, which at the end of the day is, you know, can be a six or $7,000 show or the Cuthbert, which none of us could afford to do, or you were just at the same exact venue. And if I'm like, Oh, I'm going to throw summer jam at wow hall. People are like, Oh, I can't even drink upstairs. It's hot. People smell, you know, this and that. And so it just be, it was just this culmination of just years of building frustration, me holding on to grudges, you know, other people holding grudges. And it just, I just got burnt, you know, I guess, I guess that would be the simplest way to put it, man. I was at that time I was burnt. So what changed, you know, after five years, I know doing that show with Ender and doing some shows here and there probably was a little bit of like, wow. This feels good again, you know? Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, the, you know, I'm not exactly sure how it came to be. One of the, one of the big inspirations was, you know, my, my good buddies, Abe Valdez, Dizio, and, you know, Jacob Bustamani, Jay Blanco, love you boys. They were 11 songs deep on their reunion album. And I did a song with them, um, and... I didn't even know at the time that, that they might put it on the album. I think we kind of did the song right before they really decided they were going to do the album. So, you know, I got in the booth and I, it was feeling good. It was a feel good song and I was having a good time, but really, you know, because they were about to put another album out, it's kind of like that. You get that itch where you're like, Oh, you know, the team's kind of getting back together and, you know, 
maybe if you played softball for years or you were on a flag football team or a bowling league or whatever it is, you kind of get that feeling where you're like, oh, well, maybe I don't want to miss out, you know, like if, if we're going to, you know, if the shine's going to start coming out again, then, you know, maybe I'll, I'll get back on, you know, on the bike and see if I can still ride it. And, um, you know, my buddy Todd G, man, <laughs> is a great guy and a legend in Northwest hip hop, a real life OG and a beautiful soul, a great dude, a great friend. I love the shit out of you, homie. I would not be sitting here right now doing this interview if it wasn't for Todd, because he was like, homie, you just got to do it one more time. He's like, you got to bring it back. You, you got to let them know, you know, I think they forgot, you know, a lot of these young cats are out here doing their thing. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm happy for those guys, you know, Savelle, King Delane, on and on and on, you know, um, and all those guys are on the album as well. And so he's like, you, you just, you got to show these young cats how to do it. And so um, I hopped on the internet I started searching for beats. I found the beat for how we roll, which is the, you know, the single, the first single in the video off the album. I, I knocked it out. I sent it to Todd. He called me five minutes later and he was like, bro, this is incredible. He's like, this is so good. He's like, just take this, use it as a springboard, use it as a momentum, use it as momentum, hit the ground running. And, um, that was in March. Um, and you know, by the end of July, I was, I was done with the 17 tracks. Um, and, and here we are. Yeah. That's the song we're going to play at the end of this. That's the single, you know, <clears throat> And then, like you said, there's a music video for it. So in the show notes, I'm going to have links to your Facebook page, your Instagram, and then also the, the video link to the YouTube. Uh, and definitely everybody listening to this, go check that out and then subscribe. I know that uh, your YouTube's kind of getting off the ground. Uh, so it'll be cool if people subscribe to that as you continue to do more things. Because today, actually, you were planning on shooting another music video and then weather in Oregon is it's a good thing it's raining because the whole state is on fire. So we're yes. not going to complain yes. Bring on the rain. Can you do know, the video anytime. More <laughs> rain, mother nature, please. Right. So, please. you know, there will be another day to shoot the video and then, and people can check that out. So if they subscribe to your YouTube, uh, you know, that'll be good because then they'll see when it pops up. So right now, it's, I think it's, it's only, you know, only a couple videos, but your, your, how we roll videos on there and it's a good one. It's real clean. You know, the, the production qualities is on point and, the song hits, you know, it's really, it's really, you seem real comfortable. You seem calm, you know, and just enjoying yourself in it. And so that's really good. I noticed on your interview with CJ, he was asking about, you know, why you picked the, that single. And I think the big thing was because it was just showcasing you. There's a lot of features on your album, right. but that song you picked, you're like, I want one that's going to be me first. Right. And then I'll right. do the one with the features. And I think that's a smart move, you know, because it's, it's, it's about you getting this album out and everybody that, that's on it is there to support you when you're making your production there. So that's really cool. Uh, Mac Dub, this is really great, you know, to, to, to pick your brain a little bit. And, and I'm really excited for you. Seems like you're really having fun again. And I always tell people when it comes to art, it's like, you got to focus on the process more than the production. So the end of it, you Absolutely. Know? So like you focus when you're doing art, it's not about the finished product. It's about creating it and making it in the process of doing all that. About the if you're journey. not enjoying that part, then what's the point? You know, oh, absolutely. It's all about the process and the journey. People can see straight through it if it's not something that you're actually enjoying. You know, it's just like this guy's just phoning it in, you know. So, right. so thanks for doing this and thanks for talking to me about this kind of stuff. I do want to touch on this before we play the song. Your abstract art and your photography, you know, I kind of mentioned it. Is Instagram the main spot for people it to is. do that stuff? It is. So yep. at MacDub, the link will be in the show notes. Really beautiful photography. Is that something you do just as a hobby or is that something you do also like, you know, for if people want someone to come out and do some work? I, yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I do it as a hobby. Um, I just, I, I, I don't even know how it came to be. It was, I guess they put a camera in the phone sure. and, and, I, and I, I started seeing stuff that I liked. Um, and I started, and so I just started, you know, pointing and snapping and I, I, again, it's just kind of one of those things in life where when you hear or you see something being done, I think typically you kind of know in that moment if the person that's doing it is good at it. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, like I said earlier, photography and, and rap music just happen to be two of the things that I'm good at. And so I try to do those things. Right. Um, it's cool. I really appreciated it. You know, looking through it, you got some, you got a good eye for it. You know, it's cool. It's I also, it's really, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. 
I was going to say, I think it's really important for people, you know, mental health is something I talk about a lot openly that I've struggled with mental health. And I think it's really important, especially for men. It's important for everybody, but it's important for men to address it. And one of the best ways that I've always told people, they're like, I just feel like I'm in a funk and I just, I don't know what to do. I'm like, you need to find, it sucks because it's rude. It sounds rude sometimes and you need to find a hobby, you know, you know what I mean? But it's, it's really true. It's you need really- to find some outlet, you know, and like I just said, the process of creating something and then having that finished product can be super rewarding and therapeutic. And, you know, you can write lyrics and never record it, you know, or whatever, just writing that stuff down and getting it outside of yourself. Because if you take something that caused a lot of pain and then, you know, put it out there, then you can look back and be like, look at what that pain actually created that was beautiful. So there's something that you can do with that. So I, I don't know. I just wanted to throw that in there. But I, I, I would like to say, since we're on the subject of mental health, that, um, I think this is something that we all struggle with. I, I think it's much, much more uncommon to find somebody who doesn't struggle with mental health as opposed to finding people who do. Um, and having something to do, having something to look forward to, having a goal that you're trying to reach, all of these things are at the epicenter of happiness. And it, it's so important to have something other than your nine to five, which you pay the rent and your bills with to do. I, 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 I feel bad for people who don't have things to do. You know, I hike, I bike. Um, I, when my knee isn't fucked up, um, from paddle boarding, you know, I play basketball, I make music, I do photography, I paint on and on and on. So all of these things are an escape, right? And I talked to CJ about this, right? We need to escape. We need to get away from the daily stresses that we have. These things that build anxiety in us, fear, angst, anger, all of these things. I play Xbox. I'm I'm, I'm completely addicted to 2K. Come (laughs) find me if you want to get dropped off. Um, But this is how I escape, right? That's, and that's the point is, we all need to escape. So if you are out there and you are struggling from mental illness, um, find some stuff to do, you know, walking, jogging, biking, painting rocks, picking flowers. You know, it doesn't matter what it is, right? Just have something to do. Spend time with your kids, with your grandkids, go to the coast, whatever. But you have to have something that you're waiting on that you're like, Oh, Saturday, I'm going to do this. Or in two weeks, we're going to go to Astoria, you know, like, and, and, and just find something to do to escape. Right. Please. And then, you know, I had a buddy one time, this made me laugh. He said every day he woke up, he made a list of what he was going to do. And the first thing he wrote on the list was make a list. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, why, why do you write that down? And he goes, you got to start off with, you got to start off with a success. <laughs> and I was like, that's really funny. Cause it's all, like you said, I think it's really important to, to touch on goals. People think goals, you know, I want to get a boat and it's like, no, your goal should be, I'm going to get out of bed today. I'm going right. to get out of bed. I'm going to get out of bed. I'm going to, I'm going to tell myself some affirmations, you know, some things like I'm, so that kind of stuff. I'm glad we talked about this because it's just so important for men. And in hip hop, you know, people have this tough exterior. That's kind of what turned me off to it to, to begin. We're coming sure. full circle. Sure. You know, what I've learned as I've gotten older, Cause I was so, my brother was such a bully, my older brother. And I was kind of more of like a soft edged kid. I grew up listening to like green day and shit like that, you know? Sure. So I just was kind of like, ah, the little guy was really what I wanted to fight for. And in rap, it was always kind of like, eh, it was hard for me to grasp because I, it was always people trying to be like, I'm the best. And I, yeah. I don't know, it just turned sure. me off to it, but I've learned and evolved. And I get it now that, like you said, it's an alter ego, but we're coming up on that hour. So we're kind of at the point now. I mean, we could talk for days and I'll definitely have you back on, you know, and uh, God, this COVID thing is going to be tough for shows. So it'll be interesting to see how, how you uh, navigate that, you know, getting, getting the word out about the album. And that's kind of why I wanted to have you on at least because this podcast gives you an opportunity that I know people want to see you rap. That's why you'll be busting out the videos with, with a small crew and then they can at least see it. But, you know, for the time being, it's pretty tough to put on an event. And it's going to be real. I hope that the wow hall, you know, we mentioned them a couple of times. I hope they survive. I really do. So oh, if you're listening to this and you are a big fan of local music and you're, you're saving money by not going to those shows, go donate some money to the wow hall. You know, the 12 bucks that you would have gone to the concert this month, sure. 
just throw that to the wow hall and that adds up because that could save save them you know so well mac dub tell me about the song this is how we roll uh that we're going to be playing tell me a little bit about it and then we'll get out of here oh man so how we roll i mean just west coast hip-hop at its finest right i mean just I'm I'm just a fiend for West Coast beats. I love West Coast music. I'm h- however it comes to be, like this is the lane that I am the most comfortable um in. Um you know, the I think the lyrics are real expressive and um you know, I whatever whatever happens when that when that beat comes on, you know, and I get and I get inside that rhythm um, I just feel like that's my sweet spot. Um, and, uh, and I don't use a lot of words. I just think I use them well. Um, yeah. and, and there's a reference uh, to Vince Carter in the track. That yeah. Yeah. Was- a lot, a lot of, yeah. Uh, um, a lot of old school references and throughout the entire album and the song. It was, it was, a uh, something that I did consciously, um, because I, for people that are going to listen to it, they're going to be closer to your age and my age. Um, and I, and I think that they will appreciate those old school references, um, throwback for sure. But it's cool because this is the 20, this week was the 20 year anniversary of Vince Carter jumping over that dude in the Olympics. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. That was timely. I thought that was timely that one of the greatest dunks and one of the greatest dunkers of all time. By the way, I'm like you, I'm a huge, huge basketball fan. Right. And fortunately I'm on a PlayStation player, so we'll never be on the same 2K court. Uh, I yeah. have been hearing some rumors about the next gen that it's going to so be. We might build a cross platform. Oh my God. I would love that. Would that. Be dope. So, that would be dope. Yeah, I, that would be make, dope. I always make, no one cares about this, but I always make my dude, my real height. So no one will <laughs> ever play with me in the park. Cause I'm five, nine, but you know, <laughs> fuck, fuck everybody. But no. <laughs> no, but I'm just, <laughs> so thanks a lot for talking, man. Talking to Absolutely, me. Man. I'm going to doing this. Yeah, this is a cool, brother. Cool escape from from the normalcy of what I've been up to. We're going to be hitting it hard here soon. I got one episode next week with a hockey player, but then we're going to do a lot of political stuff, you know, because the election is around the corner. And I almost made it an entire episode without even talking politics. And I'm not going to get into the the fight of it all, but it's good for for us to take these these breaks and talk about art. I know that with such a troubling time, the album had been planned for you to drop it, and then the fires hit, and you're like, ah, it throws a wrench in it. I'm actually of the belief that, especially with social media the way that it is, that it's totally okay to put out art during crisis and tragedy because people need something even to escape for 10 minutes, you know? So it it was already there too. And you can't write. It's not that that never ends, you know, that fight. So it's more than just a t-shirt people. Yeah, no, that never ends. Definitely. So uh, the conversations that we're having around race, I think there is some progress. I think that there's more allies in the white community than, than I've ever seen. And that's a good thing. So, and we need them. We and, need them. and I, you know, we're two of them. I can tell you that that's a hundred percent. Absolutely. So, so absolutely. Mac dub. Thanks for doing this. Uh, you know, you're awesome. Everybody, like I said before, there's links in the show notes to wherever you listen to this. Uh, you you know, to the Facebook, to the Instagram, and to the YouTube video. But you can also go to any platform and just search for MacDub, M-A-C-K-D-U-B, no space, so just one word. That's right. So this is uh, this is How We Roll by MacDub. MacDub, thanks a lot. Have a great day, brother. I appreciate you. Yo, this is how we roll. If you down for your crown, let a motherfucker know. Let a motherfucker know. This is how we ride. We don't care where you from if it ain't West Side. Homie on the real, we ain't dealing with no punk shit Old school flow, Vince Carter when I dunk shit Drunk in this bitch, smoking weed, tryna function I don't give a damn about your homies who be rapping Old school mackin' and I'm known to get it crackin' Used to be a player, now your boy just a captain That's the way it is, it don't matter how it happened Catch me at the show with the flow devastate. Hit me with some love, homie, miss me with that hate I ain't got no time to be wasting on weight Never act funny when it's time for money making Ask around the town about the Mac, but they know I ain't afraid to hustle wind, rain, or snow Wrote my first rhyme back in 1984 And I ain't stopped since West Coast Let's go, let's go, let's go This is how we roll If you down for your crown, let a motherfucker know Let a motherfucker know This is how we ride We don't care where you from If it ain't West Side Baseline.
lines make your neck jerk I got the flow to make you sick like that 5G network Quarantine, I can still do my thing When you fucking with Mac Dub, you fucking with a king It's Babe Ruth every time that I swing Been around before Dr. Dre made your head ring This ain't nothing but some game that I'm strutting Mac Dub stay looking young like Benjamin Button Call me the butcher cause your boy still cutting out her skating past these suckers like it really ain't nothing I know the deal, some gon' still hate Even if this shit is hotter than some fries on a plate See, either way, we gon' elevate Out of fucking with them gangsters representing that green state Yo, this is how we roll If you down for your crown, let a motherfucker know Let a motherfucker know This is how we ride, we don't care where you from If it ain't west side If it ain't west side This is how it be when you fucking with a Mac like M.A.C. Like M.A.C. This is why we came if you ain't from the west Homie, stay in your lane, in your lane